The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. The Committee meets today to consider a resolution to reject the claim that David Seamus, Director of the Office of Political Strategy and Outreach and Assistant to the President and Federal Government employee, is immune from being compelled to testify before Congress on matters relating to his official duties. The Clerk will designate the resolution. Resolution of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment at any time. The text has already been placed uh, and is distributed in each of your folders. I would now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Let me say uh, at the outset that I strongly oppose executive branch assertions of absolute immunity. I disagree with them in the Harriet Myers case, and I disagree with them here today. But one key difference is that in this case, the committee has identified no evidence, no evidence that Davis Seamus was a senior advisor to the President of the United States or anyone else in his office engaged in any inappropriate activity or conduct that violates the Hatch Act. As a result, I strongly oppose this resolution. I would like to ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to enter into the record a letter that we just received last night from Carolyn Lerner, the head of the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, additionally, I would ask unanimous consent that all back and forth letters between the White House and either staffs of the House or the Senate be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. The Office of Special Counsel, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Office of Special Counsel is the independent Federal agency charged with investigating Hatch Act violations. And it is the same office that investigated violations by the White House Office of political affairs under the Bush administration. This letter, which was just entered into the record, which all of the members should now have, explains that the special counsel reviewed all of the con correspondence between Chairman Issa and the White House regarding the new Office of Political Strategy and Outreach, which was established six months ago. Based on that review, the Special Counsel concluded as follows, and I quote, It appears that the White House adhered to OC, OSC guidance in determining the scope of activity for OPSO. OPSO appears to be operating in a manner that is consistent with the Hatch Act restrictions. Office of Special Counsel has not received any allegations that Assistant to the President David Seamus or anyone in the OPSO has violated the Hatch Act. She goes on to say, as I continue to quote, I have no reason to believe that OPSO's activities exceed those set forth in formal communications between White House lawyers and the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Again, these conclusions are from the top official at, at the independent agency with the core mission of enforcing the Federal Hatch Act. Chairman Issa originally invited the Special Counsel to testify at the Committee's hearing on July 16. Two days before that hearing, the Special Counsel submitted a written statement indicating that she planned to testify that her office had identified no evidence of improprieties. But the Chairman cut that hearing short as recessed it until today, and she was not able to testify. The Chairman invited her again to testify 
at today's hearing. But again, his office told her not to come, and again, she will not be testifying this morning. So that is why today I am making a public, the public letter received from her last night. And now the Chairman sent his own letter to the White House last night, raising concerns about the actions of two Cabinet Secretaries, Secretary Hilda Solis and Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. The actions described in both occurred in 2012, nearly two years before this new office was established in January of 2014. To my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, let me say this. We are all members of this House, and we should all be concerned with its credibility and with its authority. As I said at the beginning of my statement, I oppose the assertion of absolute immunity by the Bush White House in the Myers case. I agreed with the district court judge who concluded that the asser assertion was invalid. And today, even though this assertion is based on longstanding practice of both Republican and Democratic administrations, I respectfully disagree with this White House assertion of absolute immunity as well. But this is the worst possible case to try to test our position. As the special counsel said in her letter, we do not have an allegation of wrongdoing. The judge in the Myers case wrote that the committee's actions had to be, quote, legitimate, end of quote. And here there is no legitimate reason to create an unnecessary constitutional confrontation. I believe that the House of Representatives made significant gains as an institution in the Myers case and once in a generation gains they were. But I am deeply concerned that our committee's actions here today could threaten to reverse those gains if we pursue this case with absolutely no foundation, no basis, and no predicate whatsoever. So I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle not to support this resolution based on these meager facts. Instead, let's try to see what the remaining questions are that members may have about this new office. Even after all of the letters and the White House briefing and the documents that we reviewed, there may be other questions. But just as late as last night, the White House, through Mr. Eagleson, its counsel, was still reaching out, trying to work out accommodations, and, and left the door open so that those accommodations might be made. And then let's work together to get answers to those questions without, without resorting to these kinds of unnecessary and counterproductive actions. And, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize myself. The White House's decision not to make David Seamus available has denied the American people the opportunity to hear from the official in charge of ensuring the White House political activity complies with the Hatch Act and, in fact, the American people's tax dollars are not used to campaign. There have been Hatch Act violations in several administrations, including two by, Mr. by President Obama's own Cabinet. Well, Mr. Seamus is not, charge, not in charge of the White House political office when these violations occurred, he is now in charge. He has the re responsibility to explain on the record what this administration is doing to prevent further abuse. And I repeat, to prevent further abuse, future, what he will proactively do. The special counsel says it does not appear, based on reviewing dialogue back and forth between the White House that there is a violation. In the case of Harriet Myers and the firing of the U.S. attorneys, the President had an absolute right under the Constitution to have and to dismiss, for any reason or no reason, U.S. attorneys. There was no predicate, no criminal predicate, but there, was, there were questions, and those questions were asked to be answered by 
Congress. The White House Office is, in fact, a use of Federal taxpayer dollars in support of moving the President and the First Lady to and from and coordinating their support for fundraising for political purposes and support of candidates. There is no question that someone must have oversight. Dollars are appropriated from taxpayers to pay for this office. The special counsel is not a proactive auditor. We are. The ranking member spoke of a constitutional crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, there was no constitutional crisis. We asked for oversight pursuant to our specific committee's responsibilities, and the witness was denied in a claim, which even the ranking member says he disagrees with, of inherent immunity is before us today. Failing to comply with a congressional subpoena is a serious matter. I expect Mr. Seamus to face the consequences unnecessarily by not coming. Mr. Seamus's refusal to testify will, in, will be an issue for him should he ever seek a position requiring Senate confirmation or to run for elected office. Not only does the administration feel it is above the law in claiming inherent immunity, but it arrogantly believes that it should be held to a lesser standard than the Bush administration. Last night, I wrote to the White House counsel, Neil uh, Eggleston, and offered him an extraordinary accommodation. After he complained yesterday that our request for Mr. Seamus, public testimony differed from the Bush administration's political office directors who sat for depositions, I offered Mr. Seamus the option of committing to a deposition or transcribed interview instead of appearing here today. The White House did not accept the offer nor recant their claim of inherent immunity. The White House argues its senior officials, whose salaries are paid for by taxpayers, are immune from testifying before Congress, if deemed so by the President. The Federal Court flatly rejected this position. It is, in fact, a direct contradiction to the U.S. District Court, of the, uh, District Court for the District of Columbia when it ruled in its decision in the Committee on Judiciary versus the White House cites a legal opinion issued by the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel in claiming immunity. The opinion merely states the views of the executive branch. The authority does not outweigh that of the courts, and it does not outweigh the history of two centuries plus of this branch questioning every nickel, every dime spent on behalf of the taxpayers. The OLC opinion does not cite any case law in support of its position that presidential advisors are immune, and the opinion expressly acknowledges it is not based on precedent. The White House thinks it is immune from congressional oversight. Can it be any wonder that if we allow that, the American people will not just lose trust and confidence in this President, but in the body that we sit in, both Republicans and Democrats. I am going to read, read to you a quote. The White House must stop stonewalling and start being accountable to Congress and the American people. No one, including the President, is above the law. With your indulgence, I will read it again. The White House must stop stonewalling and start being accountable to Congress and the American people. No one, including the President, is above the law. The person who said that is Senator Harry Reid, the Majority Leader of the Senate. He was referring to the Bush Administration's unwillingness to make White House officials available for congressional testimony. Here is another one. 
the administration's extreme claims to be immune from, over, from the oversight process are at odds with our constitutional principles on which this country was founded, and I am confident the Federal courts will agree. That statement was made by then Judiciary Chairman John Conyers, and he was right. The White House Democrats, the, sorry, the House Democrats filed the lawsuit to obtain this testimony in which they ultimately prevailed. House and Senate Democrats were <coughs> unequivocally in the support of requiring the White House officials to testify before Congress. Here is a quote from then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Here is a quote from then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. By filing this lawsuit, House members recognized the need to defend Congress's subpoena power against the efforts of an administration to hide information in order to prevent the exercise of Congress's oversight and lawmaking responsibility. And I quote, this action is completely nonpartisan. Again, the words of Speaker Pelosi. Historically, Democrats and Republicans alike have scrutinized the White House political office. President Obama closed the office in January 2011 in anticipation of a critical report by the Office of Special Counsel released just days later. Both Democrats and Re Republicans condemned the dis this both Democrats and Republicans co commended this decision. So when President Des President Obama decided to reopen the office in January of this year after three years of operating without the office, the committee had some questions, and rightfully so. In fact, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, said that he was, and I quote, skeptical about the reopening given the office's history. Yet, this, this once shared skepticism has since turned into an effort that appears to be in, uh, at odds with our oversight. The White House, too, is going to great strides to criticize this oversight rather than simply cooperating. In a recent letter, the White House called the committee's efforts to rush to subpoena and, and exceptionally aggressive. It is six months since the opening and nearly that long since we began inquiring. Despite the committee's pro, uh, proactively seeking cooperation for months, the White House continues to obstruct this investigation, culminating in Mr. Seamus's defiance of a congressional subpoena and failure to appear here today. This is the second opportunity today to give Mr. Seamus the, uh, the ability to come and explain the operations. And as I said earlier, I offered an alternative in response to their request that there not be a public hearing. The President has called maintaining Democrat control of the Senate his top priority, that his prerogative, that's his prerogative, but using a taxpayer-funded office and, pers and personnel to achieve that goal skirts the line and the act of the, of, the, of the Hatch Act. This is not an investigation of the President's activities or his goals. This is simply oversight. And while the White House has made assurances the new structure is in compliance with the Hatch Act, no one from the new office has, a, has answered even some basic questions or provided documentation. The Office of Special Counsel has not been able to evaluate anything but publicly available correspondence. Couple that with serious Hatch Act violations by the Cabinet secretaries, and it becomes obvious that there are serious and legitimate concerns. What is the White House afraid of? Why wouldn't you be proud of changes made to be compliant with the goals of the Hatch Act? I expect the committee will reject 
President Obama's assertion that the White House should be afforded special treatment that House Democrats did not extend to Republican administrations when they were in the majority. Democrats and Republicans alike have, have expressed the importance of congressional oversight and the President's decision to ignore a lawful subpoena is a clear attempt to impede what we believe to be our responsibility. My colleagues in the minority can express their opinion and they, <clears throat> that they do not think oversight of this administration is legitimate. But if they express the opinion that they believe that oversight is legitimate, then there, can there be anything more basic than the committee charged with overseeing the Hatch Act asking the questions, how do we prevent violations of the Hatch Act under this administration, not only at the level of the President and First Lady, but at the level of Cabinet officers? No chairman of either party would do different or less than I am doing here today, or he or she would be shrinking from their, go their responsibilities, their pledge, and their oath. I believe strongly that today's vote is not a vote of contempt, is not a vote of anything more than a rejection of inherent immunity, because that stands before us today as the reason Mr. Seamus was not here, the reason that Mr. Seamus has not agreed or at least begun the process of agreeing to alternative means. Inherent immunity from oversight is the question before us today. Thank you. I will hold the record open until the end of the day so that all members may submit uh, written statements and other comments. Does any member wish to speak on the resolution? Does any member Mr. wish to offer an amendment? Mr. Chair. The, Mr. Tierney, you are recognized for five minutes to strike the last word. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to speak briefly on this. I think that you know, people don't necessarily disagree with the notion that absolute immunity under all circumstances is something that uh, the White House is entitled to. I think there, we draw some distinctions here very clearly between what happened during the Bush administration and what this committee and the chairman are purporting to do right now. Um, oversight, finding out how the office operates or whatever, uh, that can be done and it was in the process of being done as I understand it. Uh, and the distinctions I think are pretty interesting. There is no instance here at all uh, that the assistance of the President or anybody in the Office of Political Strategy and Outreach had violated any Hatch Act uh, or engaged in any inappropriate activity. I think Special Counsel was very clear in the letter to the Ranking Member Cummings that, and I quote, OSC has not received any allegations that assistance of the President David Simmons or anyone in OPSO has violated the Hatch Act, uh, close quote. Uh, the White House then went on, as I understand it, provided detailed information about how OPSO uh, operates and letters to the committee. I understand the committee sent over a whole gaggle full of uh, people uh, to question uh, people over there at the, at the White House for 75 minutes. And as I understand it, they exhausted all of their questions, got all their answers, and then left. Uh, and then after that, uh, a couple of other questions were purported in writing and those were answered. So there is this ongoing uh, process on that. The situation in Myers uh, during the Bush administration was completely different. Uh, that was an investigation. That wasn't just oversight. That was a total investigation uh, because uh, there had been allegations that were serious uh, and about the forced resignations of seven United States attorneys. In that instance, Harriet Myers, the White House counsel, was out of office at the time she was uh, asked to testify. Uh, here you have somebody who is in office advising the President. But the distinction is set forth in the D.C. District Court's explanation, and I quote what it said. Congress, moreover, is acting pursuant to a legitimate use of its investigative authority. Notwithstanding its best efforts, the Committee has been unable to discover the underlying causes of the forced terminations of the U.S. attorneys. The Committee has legitimate reasons to believe that Ms. Meyer's testimony can remedy that deficiency. There is no evidence that the Committee is merely seeking to harass Ms. Myers by calling her to testify. That is the Court's language, not mine. Close quote. So there is no allegation of inappropriate or illegal conduct in the situation before us today. We haven't exhausted all the other avenues of getting the information. That is an ongoing process. Uh, the Court in Myers talked about uh, there being an ongoing process and how most things were generally worked out, uh, and that the parties in the Myers case had reached a self-declared, self-imposed impasse. 
We haven't reached any impasse here. The White House has expressed its willingness to continue to discuss and give you the answers of, of how the operation works and, and has done so pretty openly all the way through. Uh, so I think the, the issue here resolves around you know, whether or not there is an impasse. There is not. Uh, whether or not there is any allegations or in, evidence or information that there is some wrongdoing. There is not. Uh, there is no ongoing investigation on that basis, and there is every other way for this to be done. I think you know, we won a pretty important victory as a Congress in the Myers case. You know, to say that in all situations uh, a White House is not entitled to absolute immunity. But then the Court had some very specific language about when it is appropriate to move forward on that basis. We are not there yet on that. And we risk, if we want to press this issue, losing some ground or at the very least tying us up in unnecessary litigation for a long period of time that doesn't serve the purpose of the American people. We could get these answers by continuing the dialogue and, until and unless we reach a, uh, some sort of an impasse and get the information that the Chairman wants and the Committee uh, may want. Uh, and at the same time, then move on to other business as well, instead of being tied up in litigation unnecessarily. Uh, and that's why I think that this is uh, premature, notwithstanding the issues of unilateral subpoena and all of that that uh, are also intended here or whatever. I just think that in that in this particular situation, we're way ahead of ourselves, uh, and we ought to back down. And we ought to just uh, you know have that period, prolonged period of, of negotiation, as the court indicates, before you reach an impasse. And then, if we can't reach some accommodation of finding out the information about how the process is moving along and how the office is operating, uh, then you know, we will talk about it again. But as I understand it, you know, all the questions were exhausted at the first meeting. Subsequent questions were materialized and they were answered. And I suspect if other questions arise, they can be answered without uh, pressing forward on a subpoena that was unilaterally issued. And with that, I yield back my time. I, thank uh, you, I yield my time to Mr. Cummings. Uh, gentleman yields. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make one other distinction. I'm just trying to associate myself with your words. Um, in the Myers case, there was also a referral to the Office of Special Counsel. Here there is no referral. And for those of you who were not here earlier today, I asked the Chairman, uh, and I quote, you are saying that, if I understand that to your knowledge, Mr. Siemens has done nothing wrong and his office has done nothing wrong. The Chairman responded by saying, quote, uh, we are accusing neither the President nor this four-person office of, of any wrongdoing, end of quote. Thank the gentleman. Back. I yield back. The gentleman from Utah. I thank the chairman, and I, I, I thank you for bringing this up. I think this is uh, it's important that Congress stand up for itself. Where, where is this, uh, this newfound immunity from having to come to Congress because you are an advisor to the President? White House hasn't claimed any executive privilege. They are not claiming that. Can we, uh, where are the bounds of this newfound immunity? Can they just simply say that uh, you can never come up here because, well, I did nothing wrong? Is that the standard? I mean, that is what I hear. As my, my colleague Trey Gowdy and, and Jim Jordan like to, to point out here, can we ask any questions of this person? Can we talk about good news? Can we ask about appropriations? Is an advisor to the President a cabinet-level person? seems to me that Secretary Kerry, the Secretary of Defense, the others are advisors to the President. They come up here on a routine basis all the time. Secretary of State comes before Foreign Affairs on a regular basis. I also find it interesting, Mr. Chairman, that this person's title is Director of Office of Political Strategy and Outreach. What does that mean? It's a new office. What is outreach? Can anybody answer that question? What is outreach? We are funding it with taxpayer dollars. If we are going to do proper oversight, it is not just following some headline because there is some scandal in a whistleblower. We should be, be doing regular oversight of a whole, whole host of agencies, even when things are going well. This is how we do things. I, I, I think it is interesting that the argument is there is no legitimate reason to talk to them. Of course there is. That is what makes the United States of America the, the most unique country on the face of the planet. We are self-critical. We do take a good hard look. We do look under the hood. And we do find out what is going on. If there is executive privilege, a communication direct with the President, then claim that. We will be very respectful of it. There is no reason why we can't have a dialogue and discussion with this person. I find it interesting the White House will send over five attorneys to come brief the staff. But when we want to do that in the light of day, 
when we want to have it open and transparent, remember, this is going to be the most transparent, you know, most transparent president in the history of our nation. When we want to do that in the light of day, they say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to let the public see that. We're just going to let the staff in a closed hearing see that. Isn't there something fundamentally wrong with that? Yes, there is. And you know what? As Trey Gowdy has pointed out time and time again, the same standard no matter who's in the White House. I wasn't here during the Bush administration. I suspect there are a host of things that were wrong. Let's come up with a standard, no matter who's in the White House, that you want to live with. But I can't live with the idea that they are, quote-unquote, immune from testifying before Congress. They won't even come answer a question. They're not pleading the fifth. They're not saying that they've got executive privilege. They're just immune from even showing up. That's a very dangerous precedent. It is not something we should, we should allow to have happen. I support this resolution. We need to stand up for ourselves, and I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I want to, I want to thank the gentleman. The ranking member appropriately noted something that, that I said earlier today in a colloquy, and I think it is important that we remind everyone of what he said, because we agree on that. There is no predicate of some criminal act here. This is in, about inherent oversight. But there are questions, and there is a history. There are acts that have happened during this President's tenure which violated the Hatch Act by individuals. And there is a history under previous Presidents. During the months, March, April, May, June, and now most of July, that we have been seeking answers the President has gotten into Air Force One time and time again and raised millions of dollars. This Office of Political Affairs has coordinated those trips. The American people undoubtedly have written to the Congressman, have written to newspapers, and have written to the Office of Special Counsel concerned about the use of Air Force One for the President and other aircraft for the First Lady use of aircraft for the Vice President any time they go and do either official trips and add a political event or they simply go out on a political event. We believe strongly that that history is well established. We are not objecting to it, but we have an oversight responsibility, and I would ask you all to remember that is the question before us today, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, the next in line holding his hand up is Mr. Lynch. Thank you, gentlemen. I thank the chair for yielding. I, I do think recourse to the law is probably a, a good starting point on this. And uh, we do have a, a very strong, uh, well uh, plowed area of the law called prior restraint. And under the doctrine of prior restraint, which is very firm within our constitutional uh, fabric, the law does not abide prior restraint. And what we are doing here is you are saying that this advisor to the President has, has engaged in no illegal, there is no allegation of illegal conduct here on the part of the President's advisor. We are not saying that. We just want to haul him in here. We just want to haul him in here, put a subpoena on him, have them sit here, answer questions under oath. Okay? So, so in its normal balance, the law would, would look at the balance of interests. One, one interest is, is the ability of the President to have some advisors to, to receive counsel. Your interest is in finding out what it is, is to uh, basically get inside that counsel and, and to, to find out what they are thinking, with no allegation of anything, any wrongdoing. You are trying to cut off and have a chilling effect on that communication between a presidential advisor and the president, with no allegation of wrongdoing whatsoever. That is what you are trying to do here. And, and, and my, my belief is, is that is bad for any president not only this President, but every previous President. 
if they can't talk to their advisor without Congress, with no allegation of wrongdoing, hauling their advisor before them with a subpoena or otherwise and demanding answers on that relationship, that communication between the President and his advisor, that, that's very bad for our government. That's very, very bad for, for the executive branch. I, I think it's bad for the American people as well. Will the, will the gentleman yield? Briefly. I appreciate it. If there is executive privilege, communication direct with the President, they just need to claim it. No, no. The, the President should not, in every single case, have to, to fight to be able to talk to their advisors, reclaiming my time. There is recourse for the gentleman. There is recourse for the chairman. You have the courts. You have the Hatch Act. You have legislation. We are lawmakers. We could, we could change the law. All we could, we could bring charges. Your problem with those recourses is you're, you're saying, you're, you're, you're stipulating that this man has done nothing wrong. So you don't have a way in. Your problem is he hasn't done anything wrong and you've admitted it. That's why you're having a problem getting answers because there's, 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 no, there's, no, there's no complaint of wrongdoing here. The, will, just, will, will this is just a... Will the gentleman yell? Not, not right now. Let me finish my thought. So, so under, the normal, under the normal procedures is we don't bring charges until there's some wrongdoing. We, we, don't, we don't prosecute under the law until there's wrongdoing. You, you want to skip that part. You want to skip that part. You don't want to wait till he does wrongdoing. You, want, you don't want to think something up. I mean, you know, you know, creative minds could come up with some allegation at some point of some wrongdoing somewhere to, to drag the, the gentleman down, but we haven't even bothered with that. Will, will, will the gentleman yield? I will. Go ahead. Do you believe that the only people we should call before the Oversight Committee are those that have been accused of wrongdoing? I'm, no. No, okay, I, well. no, no. I, should, I think there should be an allegation, some, something, believe me, Take a look around well, but at this, this government. Will the gentleman yield for a quick, quick question? No. Let, let me respond to your last question first. Look, there's an, this, this body, this oversight committee, has, has plenty of work to do. Our, our jurisdiction is when something r bad happens or something wrong is going on involving the United States government, it's our job to, to oversee that. We have plenty on our plate. We have a target-rich environment. With all the things going on in the world today, and, and we're subpoenaing folks who haven't done anything wrong, all I'm saying is our priorities are, are, are misplaced, and I, and I think you're, you're uh, impinging on a basic prerogative that the President has to get free and unfettered counsel from his advisors, and, and we're trying to interfere with that. It is a prior restraint on communications. I yield. One, 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 uh, uh, the gentleman's person. time has expired, and he's yielded back. Mr. Mike has recognized that I think the gentleman from Utah wants 30 of your seconds. No, he doesn't. The gentleman is recognized. Well, I just heard the commentary, and I respect the gentleman's opinion from uh, Massachusetts, but um, first of all, all I have to do is look at the history of this. The White House political office was closed in January of 2011. It was, just, it was closed just days before a scathing report about abuse and misuse of that office occurred. Uh, now look at the history. It opened, uh, what, January, just a, uh, was it January of this year, the beginning of this year, 2014. Now again, um, it was Shakespeare said something's rotten in Denmark. Well, something smells awfully fishy in Washington. Now, I don't know where my colleagues on the other side of the aisle were this week, but the President of the United States, in fact, even the most liberal media, and as I went to bed last night, uh, uh, I saw the pre President's Air Force One uh, landing. They broke in on one of the stations as he arrived. Uh, and uh, he had just finished a three-day whirlwind on Air Force One a very valuable federal asset. He's had a, a tour around the United States running his fishing nets for political purposes. He's not running for office. Again, he can't do that. I think the Constitution prohibits that. 
but he's taking the White House and its assets, uh, which is obvious to anyone on the planet, and using them for political purposes to the extent at which, again, even the liberal media is having heartburn. Well, the gentleman. So, no, I, w I won't yield uh, because, um, again, we, this committee has the right to investigate this matter, how these assets are being used. This office is now open, reopened, and we've seen a, a use of this office unparalleled in the history of administrations. Yes, President Bush, President Reagan, President Clinton, they all use federal assets for political purposes. But this office has reopened, and again, we've, uh, it, it's, it's like this, the uh, President of the United States is spending so much of his time on political matters using federal assets for that purpose in an unprecedented manner. Again, we, I get the schedule, almost every schedule I get from the President that comes up. Don't you members get it too? Uh, he uses it for some excuse for one little thing, uh, New York and, and two political events, California, Colorado, Texas. I'm just talking about the last uh, few weeks. So yes, we have a right and an obligation as the chief investigative body in the House of Representatives to see what's going on with this reopened political office using assets and taxpayer money. Uh, is there abuse? We don't know. That's our purpose. Does this individual have immunity or does he have some uh, executive privileges? There's no way. This is a political office. He's not advising him on policy in the uh, Middle East. He's not advising him on uh, federal policy uh, to Congress. This is a political office using assets of the taxpayers, and this committee has every right and obligation to investigate what is going on. I'm pleased to yield back the balance of my time. Uh, I, Mr. Chaffetz. Or yield it to you. Mr. Chaffetz. I, I think the gentleman from Florida makes an exceptionally good point. This is a political office. It's not as if he's advising the president on substantive policy matters. Uh, the, the other thing I would like to, 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 to highlight is we don't know what we don't know. And a review of the documents may yield nothing. It may yield something. It may yield more questions. We've been given zero documents. And if somebody's going to go out there and make the case that, no, we shouldn't even look at the basic documents, that, that's, that's quite a new standard. And again, I would ask on the other side of the aisle who want to defend the president at all costs, what is the outreach? Outreach doesn't sound to me like this is just private communication with the president. If they are the Office of Political Strategy and Outreach, what does that mean? What do they do? They're using taxpayer dollars to do it. And I think we have a legitimate reason to look at it. There may be nothing there, but if you're going to be the most transparent presidency in the history of the United States, then show us what you got. Answer some questions. Do it in the light of day. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Somebody get uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia is next in seniority. Mr. Chairman, uh, this discussion uh, uh, is perplexing in as much as it involve, involves members of Congress, where some of the root principles of what is basically at stake here seem to be misunderstood. <laughs> the gentleman from Utah said, we don't know what we don't know. We are talking about an immediate advisor to the President. Uh, when you say you don't know what you don't know, you're really talking the classic language of a fixing of a fishing expedition. We don't know what we don't know, but if we fish around, we sure are about to find. Would the gentlelady something. yield? I haven't finished my point, Mr. Chairman. But I agree with the gentlelady that we don't know what we don't know. Earlier on, before the gentlelady came in, we were very clear. This is simple. This has started off simply as oversight of something with a. History well, we're of claiming my time, Mr. Chairman, uh, because I want to make a far more fundamental point. Uh, this is, to be sure, not about executive privilege. It's not about the kind of language we throw around in this committee. It is about something far more fundamental, and that is the separation of powers itself. My Republican colleagues 
are about to file suit against the President of the United States based on this weighty notion of separation of powers. They want separation of powers uh, observed when it comes uh, to the Congress, but when the President essentially, that is what he is saying, under a constitutional separation of powers government, I do not have to send my immediate advisors to speak with you. A and the analogies that have gone back and forth on the other side as if this were an investigation of an agency shows that there is no understanding about the separation of powers itself. The President's immediate advisor is not an agency, and this is not a matter of policy. Uh, this is a fishing expedition, and yet the President uh, has come to allow the committee to understand the fundamentals of the office. You want to understand what outreach means? You want to understand why we have set up this office? They have been over here time and again. But once you want to call Mr. Semkis, you are calling the chief advisor to the President itself. Yeah, I agree uh, that there are circumstances where you don't need wrongdoing, but you need a predicate for a subpoena. You need more than a fishing expedition. You don't have a right to know everything in a separation of powers government, my friend. That is the difference between a parliamentary government and a separation of powers government. This is an immediate advisor to the President. If you want separation of powers respected so deeply that you are about to file suit against the President, uh, it seems to me that at the very least you ought to be willing to continue in this process until you have exhausted uh, all of the remedies still available to you to find out as much as you can about this office before doing a showcase fishing expedition subpoena desired, that designed uh, clearly uh, it's more to get the attention of the press than to get the attention of the President. And I yield. I, I, Gentlemen, lady, yield. Uh, lady, I, yield. I, I yield to the ranking member. Yeah, I, I want to thank the gentle lady, and I associate myself with uh, your comments. Um, one of the things I wanted to add is so that the public will be clear is that um, the Office of Special Counsel uh, has reviewed the various communications. Um, the they have, and both sides have been uh, given information showing that um, the report uh, from back in 2008 of uh, an investigation by the Waxman Committee and then uh, a more recent report by the Office of Special Counsel, all of that has been given to folks in this office and they are adhering to that. And the Office of Special Counsel has said that. And I, I think that they have bent over backwards trying to accommodate, as you have said, and I think there is a, clearly a question of separation of powers. And I thank the lady for, gentle lady for yielding. I, I, thank, I thank the gentleman, the gentle lady. I am informed that there are two more uh, people who seek recognition, uh, perhaps sharing that time on your side. Is that, is that correct? I would like to try to just organize. If, if the chair will give us six minutes to split, we can do that. Well, wait a minute. Uh, if if it is fine with the ranking member, I would ask unanimous what? consent that uh, we split six minutes per side uh, to bring this to a conclusion, if that is acceptable. That is acceptable. That's acceptable. Okay. Uh, then, without objection, so ordered. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia will control those six minutes. The gentleman is recognized. And be kind to your friend next to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the original title of this hearing hardly confirms the assertion that we are just simply trying to get at the truth, that uh, we recognize that 